Christ it is a great joy for Father Scott and for me to be with you um, today. This is really an extraordinary, an historic moment, um, not only for your congregation, but for the life of our ordinary. And um, I can't tell you what a, what a joy it was to begin the liturgy um, this morning with um, all of this happy singing and happy faces. And uh, I, I can't thank you enough for the choir. Start to this, and I want to uh, I want to pay tribute to Father Ed Meeks for his courage and his faithfulness in leading your congregation to this historic moment. There are all sorts of obstacles that the evil one throws in the path on the way to the journey to full communion, and I know that he has with patience. Uh, kept his prayers going, and he's just plowed ahead. And, and uh, he is a real sign to many all around the United States and Canada um, how to do it. How do you lead your congregation into the Catholic Church, into the ordinary? And, and he's done a beautiful job. I'm convinced that this is exactly what Pope Benedict intended. Uh, to see devout Anglicans setting sail on this great journey to Catholic unity. And I want to congratulate um, your pastor, your rector, our Father Ed on his ordination to the priesthood yesterday at St. Matthew's Cathedral in Washington. Thank 
context in which to understand this. Many of our friends uh, throughout the United States and Canada um, who are considering the ordinary continue to struggle to make this vital decision to become Catholic, to return home and to embrace Catholic fullness. I ask for your prayers for those who stand at the precipice, that they may be strengthened in faith and hope and charity. Our forebears connected with the feast of the Nativity of St. John the Baptist to the ancient pagan festival of the summer solstice festival of light. And I like rather, um, are there any herbalists in the congregation today? <laughs> I rather like this metaphor. In Germany, there developed a tradition um, on the night before St. John's Nativity Day of going out into the meadows and fields and gathering the blooming flowers known as St. John's Wort. I don't know if you've ever known much about St. John's Wort, but um, an herbalist calls this the happy herb. It's, it's the way that our forebears treated depression. Um, and so the people would bring the St. John's Wort to church on the feast of the nativity of St. John the Baptist and ask for a blessing, a blessing for a happy life a life that is full of the Spirit. I like that metaphor. For those who are wandering, exhausted, and dispirited, may the example that you are setting today be a tonic for them. The joy of being Catholic makes this journey worth it. And what a happy coincidence that your homecoming should be on this feast of of St. John the Baptist. It's a little bit like Christmas in June. And I don't know if you've ever thought about this, but um, I've never been really great at mathematics, but as a young boy, I love playing with these ideas. Jesus was born on December 25th, right? Right? Well, we don't really know, but the Emperor Constantine said he was, so... <laughs>
celebrate the birthday of only three persons properly. All the saints, we celebrate their death day, the day when they are called home to heaven. But we celebrate the natural birthdays of only three, Jesus, his mother, and John the Baptist. By a special act of grace, Mary and John were called, even before they were created, to be the instruments of the incarnation of the Son of God. John as the herald, Mary as the vessel. St. Augustine said that the reason for this was that John was filled with the Holy Spirit at the time of Mary's visitation to Elizabeth, his mother. He was remembered in Elizabeth's womb six months along. Therefore, Augustine says, his birth was itself a holy mystery, as he was free from the power of sin before he was born. At Mary's arrival, he leaped in his mother's womb. Already he had been marked out, designated before he was born. These are divine matters and exceed the measure of human understanding, St. Augustine said. John, in his mother's womb, already had taken up his sacred calling. The voice of the Blessed Virgin Mary filled Elizabeth with the Holy Spirit. And that was a unique grace that John, in his mother's womb, participated in. Now, for us, this just blows our mind how these incredible things that are working our salvation out are happening in Utah. These lessons are a powerful testimony to the sacredness of human life from the moment of conception. Today, Isaiah 59, we read that the Lord called me from my birth, from my mother's womb, he gave me his name, my name. Psalm 139, we thank God that we are fearfully and wonderfully made. We are knitted by our creator in our mother's womb. Acts 13, Paul speaks of how God promised to King David that in his loins, in his lineage to come, the Savior Jesus Christ would be born to come. And as we join the Catholic Church, this is one of the more distinctive features of Catholic life today, is this, this tremendous witness to the sacredness of human life from the moment of conception to the moment that God calls us home in our natural death. And, um, and while we, as Anglicans, would sometimes pay lip service to this, it's very, we are joining a church for whom this is the very lifeblood of our witness, our call to be witnesses in this country. Today we are beginning the fortnight of freedom, which, of course, um, the bishops of the Catholic Church have called so that we might um, celebrate the religious liberty that we have in the United States, that we um, could hold forth to the deepest principles that we have without interference from the state. And not only are we asking for the gift of freedom and liberty, that's our right as Americans. But as Catholics now, we make this one of the most important witnesses of our life as we live it out in this world today. Um, and these lessons from the Feast of the Nativity of St. John are, are vitally important, vitally important lessons form our consciences, how we think about the nature of human life. I don't know of any text in the Bible that are as powerful and dramatic about the reality of human life in the womb, from the moment of conception, as these lessons are. One of the 
But he offered a remarkable perspective on our gospel lesson. And I would like to close with this this morning. Maximus said, what we see here is the infant, John, giving his father, Zachariah, back his voice. I looked at some of the other church fathers and I find they really did make a lot of this point. St. Augustine does as well. It's an amazing thing that John was able to give his daddy his voice back. Remember that when the Archangel Gabriel appeared to old Zachariah to promise him the birth of a son, Zachariah didn't believe it. He said, my wife and I are too old, this can't happen to us. And because of his lack of faith, what happened to him? He lost his voice. He couldn't speak for nine months. He couldn't speak. But when Gabriel, the archangel, had closed, the little child unlocked. So when it came time, eight days after John's birth, for him to be circumcised and named in the temple, old Zachariah was given a tablet so he could write who he would have his son called. They all expected that he would be called Zachariah after his father. And Zachariah wrote on the tablet, his name shall be John. That act of obedience of faith opened his mouth, freed his tongue. So not only could he write John on the tablet, but now he could speak it. And the father said, it is as if this little child gave his father the ability to speak again. I think that is a marvelous sign for us this morning. The gift of full communion brings to the church's sons and daughters the gift of the Holy Spirit. Life in the church deepens our life in the Spirit, who fills us and empowers us to share in this ministry of proclaiming Jesus Christ. An imperfect faith leaves us unable to speak. But like Zachariah, faith that is renewed and deepened means that our tongue has now been free. Our tongue has been loosed. We can speak words of faith with joy, with clarity, and with power. That is why the new evangelization should play such an important part in the mission of the ordinary and of the chair of St. Peter. Some of us have come from a church which literally could not say what it believed. Some of you have never had any experience in the Episcopal Church, but those of you who have will understand that, that the church came to a point where when, for instance, in ecumenical discussions, the Catholic side would say, well, what do you believe about this or that? And they had honestly to say and to admit we can't say exactly what it is that we believe. And what's remarkable about the church which you are joining is you will never be left in doubt again. You'll never be left in doubt again. For a priest, this is everything. Because when you're in the middle of a very difficult situation in a church, a pastoral situation, and you have to make a hard decision. And you tell the people, I respect you, but I think we have to do it this way. We have to go this way. And then they say, well, Father, that's just your opinion. That was what my whole life used to be like. I heard it all the time. But now, your priest can say, no, it's not 
just my opinion. It is the teaching of the church, it is the firm conviction and teaching of the church that this should be so. And dear friends, I have found, my wife has found, this to be a moment of incredible liberation, incredible liberation, that we can belong to a church that is firm and secure in her judgments and what she teaches to be true. Because it is given by Jesus Christ, it is confirmed by the Holy Spirit, and we can have confidence that it is teaching that will bring us to God the Father. Um, I, I, I cannot, I'm today, I'm, what was, it was St. Andrew's Day in 2009 that I became a Catholic. And there has not been one day since that time that I have not absolutely rejoiced in the gift of becoming a Catholic. And I pray for that for you as well. Um, you, you might, some of you might go through a period of time the way I did where um, I, I became an insufferable convert. <laughs> uh, it's, it's a normal thing. It's like, it's like a, a fever that you get in the flu or something like that. It goes away. <laughs> um, and your friends will be glad when it goes away because you're going to so excited about what's happening to you and you want to share it. And um, all of that, um, you know, finger in the eye stuff will, will gradually subside, but what you'll find to stay is an incredible joy in the heart and a deep, deep love for Christian people wherever you find them and a desire to help them, to come alongside them and help them in bringing down this gift of full because then we put ourselves very much right in the heart of Jesus' prayer for us, that we may be one as he and his Father are one. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.